Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, f the first Jean Monnet event uh, that we are organizing uh, this year, uh, the first of several. Uh, I'm Dionistin Drakopoulos. For those who don't know me, um, I hold the Jean Monnet Chair in Parliamentary Democracy and European Integration at Birkbeck, and I'm the host, chair, and organizer of this event today, which brings together, uh, I'm pleased to say, a stellar cast of uh, experts and commentators on German politics to discuss uh, the outcome of last Sunday's election in Germany and some of its implications for the rest of us, including Germany, of course. Um, the rules of the game are very uh, simple and very clear. Um, you will have the opportunity to ask, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end. Um, you are expected to post comments and ask questions through the chat facility that exists on the right hand side. I will make a choice uh, towards the end in order to start uh, a discussion. Each speaker will speak for 15 minutes, um, starting with Professor Andreas Bush, whom I will present shortly. Uh, he will be followed by Annette Dittert, who sadly has to leave us at 7 o'clock. So if you have a question about um, Annette Dieter's uh, uh, presentation, please ask at the end of that presentation. Uh, can I, before we start, can I ask everyone to switch their microphones off um, because there is a, some feedback, okay, which has ended now. Okay, um, so the the point uh, that I made earlier was that you are allowed to uh, make comments and ask questions through the chat. I will make a choice and then uh, I will present uh, these questions so as to start a debate. The first uh, of today's panelists is Professor Andreas Busch from the University of Göttingen in Germany, formerly uh, an Oxonian from the University of Oxford, who has written extensively on broad range of topics that relate uh, but are not limited to German politics. He will uh, talk to us um, for 15 minutes on uh, Angela Merkel's uh, legacy. He will be followed by Annette Dittert, who is uh, one of the most prominent German uh, journalists. She's currently leading the London office of ARD, the first public uh, TV channel uh, of Germany. And she will be followed by a colleague, Isabel Hertner, who teaches uh, European politics at King's College, uh, London. Um, without further ado, Andreas, thanks very much for agreeing to speak to us today. You have the floor. My pleasure, Dionysus. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here, if only virtually. I, of course, would have much liked, uh, much more preferred to, to be there in person. Angela Merkel has been the subject of numerous uh, articles, books, and TV programs uh, um, over the last couple of months. Um, her departure from office, which will take place uh, relatively soon, um, um, is a subject to uh, much discussion. And um, indeed, what is special about her leaving in the first place is that it is voluntary. Uh, it's a rare thing in democratic systems without term limits. Um, so um, in the 15 minutes I have, uh, I must concentrate. So I decided to talk about three topics mainly. I'm sure that anything that I uh, leave out, uh, we can discuss later in the question and answer session towards the end of the panel. I'll take you through three steps and down. This is, could you, this is not rather uninformative. Could you take the next picture, please? Right. So um, I'll do three steps. Uh, Merkel, the person, Merkel, the CDU chair, and Merkel, the chancellor. And what you see here is uh, Angela Merkel uh, uh, giving the um, uh, um, Christmas address to the uh, German uh, population uh, 16 times in a row um, and uh, varying, as you can see, different outfits. So this is just a sample of um, the um, the 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 long the 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 extensive duration of of her term in office 16 years is indeed a very long time and when merkel became in 2005 um just um, to, for some of you to, to 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 give some sort of reference points uh, this was a time when there were no smartphones imagine tinder didn't exist and tony blair had just won his third term of office as a labor prime minister 
Um, and Annalena Baerbock, the um, Green Party candidate for the German Chancellorship, had just finished her master's degree at the London School of Economics. So you can see it was quite a different world. And Angela Merkel was an unlikely chancellor to begin with, um, not because of the uh, grand coalition that she first formed and which many British commentators uh, thought was one of chalk and cheese uh, and would be lucky to last uh, two years. Um, she was, she, she <laughs> proved them wrong, of course. Um, she was also unlikely as a woman, um, as an East German, um, and as somebody who lacked the extensive party internal networks that many of her competitors had. Um, Angela Merkel was born in West German Hamburg, uh, but her father, who was a Lutheran pastor, uh, decided to move his family to the GDR only three or four months after her birth uh, in order to help his church there. Uh, so Angela Merkel grew up in a clearly Christian household uh, in communist East Germany, where, for example, her mother, who was a teacher, was not allowed to teach. Um, where she went to school, um, she was a member of the communist youth organization, a requirement if you wanted to attend university, um, and eventually studied quantum physics. Um, I have a nice quote from her which explains why she chose that subject and I would like to quote it uh, to you. Um, I, um, I decided to study physics in the GDR, she, she said, because I was quite sure that you can suspend a lot of things, but not gravity, not the speed of light, even in the GDR. Two and two makes four, even under Honecker, the geriatric uh, GDR leader. And her training as a scientist has often been referred to. I'm quite sure it shaped her also her political outlook, especially with her focus on facts. Once the wall came down in November 1989, uh, so more than 30 years ago, she became politically active and she joined a new party which then formed, which only months later merged with the Christian Democratic uh, um, Party, the uh, center right party in the German party system. And in the first general election in unified Germany in 1990, she ran for parliament and became an MP in the Bundestag. Kohl immediately appointed her Minister of Women and Youth Affairs, which she served as from 91 to 1994, and then Minister of the Environment, 1994 to 98. And in 1998, the um, Christian Democrat uh, um, hated government ended uh, in electoral defeat. And after that, the new CDU chair, Wolfgang Schäuble, I'm sure you've heard his name, uh, nominated her to become um, secretary general of the CDU. Oh, um, Dionysus, I completely forgot. Sorry, please, the next next slide, and I'm already more or less done with that. I'm happy to, 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 to send you the slides later if anybody wants them. Um, so I'm already sort of almost through with that um, part, Merkel, the person. Um, because I've already moved to her becoming uh, Secretary General of the CDU. So please, the next slide, Dionysus. Exactly, thank you. Um, the CDU in 1998 plunged into a um, crisis over illegal party funds. And the former Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who was by then the honorary chairman, deepened the crisis by refusing to name the donors. Uh, when Merkel criticized him for that, she was almost sacked. But for once, her lack of networks uh, was a positive because she was credibly seen as part of a new start and uh, allowed to stay. When Schäuble, the party chairman, also fell over the party uh, of a funding uh, scandal, she all of a sudden found herself in charge of uh, the party and used a number of regional um, conferences that were actually designed to dissolve the crisis to present herself to the party. And in April 2000, she was elected uh, chair of the CDU, the first female office holder in a then still rather conservative uh, party. In 2002, at the German general election, she left the uh, chancellor candidacy uh, to uh, Bavarian minister president Edmund Stoiber, who narrowly lost to Gerhard Schröder. Um, but when the latter one called a snap election in 2005, 
um, she was internally unopposed and uh, won and eventually uh, became chancellor. Again, she was the first woman to hold that office. Her rather neoliberal programmatic stance, which she had initiated uh, at the Leipzig party conference prior to the election, had been rejected by the electorate, or so was the interpretation uh, of the CDU's relatively weak result. Um, and in a display of ideological flexibility, she teamed up with the Social Democrats instead. Um, she has been party chair uh, for 18 years. She left that office in uh, 2018. Um, there has been a substantial change, um, but um, as is obvious at the moment, even her attempt at an orderly uh, succession um, has actually not come to much and the party is in a substantial crisis now, which we can perhaps discuss later. Um, the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, those who predicted, and I quoted them, uh, that uh, the um, 2005 um, government, Merkel government, would be a short-lived coalition, uh, were all proved wrong. Um, when she will step down in a, a couple of weeks or months, that depends on the duration of the coalition talks, she will have served 16 years. Um, and indeed, she even stands a chance of breaking the record set by Helmut Kohl, for the German Chancellorship, and um, I did the numbers, it's on the 19th of, of December, so less than three months to go when she will become the uh, longest uh, office holder um, in, in, for, for the Chancellorship. She has worked with two different coalition partners over four terms of office, uh, three times with the Social Democrats uh, and once with the Liberals who were expelled from Parliament um, after she uh, had dealt with them, that um, is a, an experience that British Liberal Democrats know as well. Um, one of the most distinguishing features of hers is a sort of calm leadership, um, upon which can also one can also sort of negatively comment, but I'll do that, reserve that for later. A number of crises that she has dealt with both, domest both domestically and internationally. I just want to briefly uh, remind you of them, the financial markets crisis after 2008, which um, the first grand coalition managed to deal with uh, relatively well, with less unemployment and fewer losses in economic growth than many other um, um, European or international countries, uh, mainly owing to a pragmatic and massively uh, massive active labor market policy. This crisis then more or less um, uh, was, was, was quickly followed by uh, the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone after 2010. Um, there she managed to um, find European level compromises, which were actually quite critically discussed in Germany, but she um, um, helped uh, or fought off a breakup of the um, common um, currency, uh, which would have been absolutely disastrous for Germany above all. So this also ultimately got the solution accepted within Germany. Um, although I add that um, it's the discussion about that solution that is the birth moment of the AFD, which I will come to uh, back later. Um, 2015 is the so-called refugee crisis in which she kept uh, Germany's borders open to several hundred thousand uh, refugees and migrants from uh, Syria, but various other places as well. Uh, this is something that won her um, um, much applause on the sort of liberal international um, uh, scene, but was also severely criticized. Uh, it brought domestic tensions and ultimately uh, um, brought divisions both within her party, but also led to the rise of the aforementioned uh, a, a right wing populist party, the AFD. And um, the uh, crisis that ensued in 2020, 21 was, of course, the coronavirus pandemic that you all know, which again brought um, controversy and challenges. But um, the distinguishing uh, mark was that um, the German population for about three quarters of it uh, was content with the way she handled it. So it was widely supported uh, by the German electorate. So um, a few closing words about her legacy. 
Uh, one thing is uh, a very long reign. 16 years is exceptional um, by international standards, uh, but also within uh, uh, Germany, uh, a very long reign. And um, we must remember that many people can only think of her uh, as the office holder. In, indeed, uh, the, in the um, recent campaign, there was a, uh, a placard by the SPD, which um, I have to quote in German, um, assured the population that er kann Kanzlerin, he can do Madam Chancellor. So um, the the office is in a way sort of, a per, she personifies the office. She's been a dominant figure and she has been popular to the end. She is still uh, leading the list of Germany's 10 most popular politicians. And that is something that is truly exceptional because very often uh, um, leading politicians towards the end of their uh, period in office are no longer very popular. And that's why that period of office comes to an end. Um, with her as the chancellor candidate, <laughs> um, the CDU would very likely have won uh, last Sunday's election. Um, there are also in her legacy a number of things that one wouldn't have expected of a Christian Democrat. Uh, for example, uh, the decision to leave uh, for Germany to quit um, nu using nuclear energy. This uh, happened uh, a very quick policy U-turn after the Fukushima disaster in 2011. Also, um, um, abandoning military conscription, another um, thing that one would not normally associate with a conservative-leaning Christian democratic government, uh, or accepting same-sex uh, marriage, which um, uh, was um, uh, is, a, is a law passed under her government in 2017, although she personally voted against it, but she paved the way towards a decision, and it was clear that that one would be positive. And um, joint a European level bond issues um, in, during the uh, pandemic, a major step um, and a major change of the fiscal regime uh, on the European level. Um, Jeremy Cliff in a recent New Statesman portrait of hers uh, comes to the assessment and I quote him, she is the preeminent European leader of the post 1989 era. That's quite something um, um, and um, I'm sure many people sort of will agree with that. Of course, I don't want to just sort of phrase her. I also want to add a few uh, criticisms. And the main one perhaps is that she has induced in Germany a certain political sleepiness because um, she was so calmly and confidently at the helm for such a long time that German political discourse has become a bit lame. Um, this the phrase that has analytically been coined for that is asymmetric demobilization, which sounds very social scienty. Um, but what it means is an election strategy that functions on the basis of avoid, avoiding making statements about controversial issues with the goal of sort of demobilizing um, your political opponents. Um, we have seen um, um, electoral turnout uh, drop. Uh, uh, although it has been going up again over the last uh, two elections, so that's um, quite okay. But but the whole whole style of hers sort of um, comes with that uh, with under that label. Um, but my confident prediction towards the end now will, is that uh, her calmness in leadership will soon be missed. Um, perhaps the greatest compliment to her is that Olaf Scholz, the chancellor candidate of the SPD and most likely successor um, has almost built a campaign out of trying to mimic her in that respect, down to even using her trademark diamond hand gesture. Okay, I'll leave it at that um, and I look forward to the discussion. I'm eager to hear what Anita and Isabel have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, without further ado, I'll pass the floor on to Anita Dietert who, as I said earlier, uh, heads the London office of the IRD, the first uh, German public TV station and is an award-winning uh, journalist who sadly has to leave us at 7 o'clock. So exceptionally, after Annette's uh, presentation, if you have any, co any questions you would like to ask, uh, please post them on the chat line. I will uh, make a selection and ask on the spot. But if you have any questions or comments that relate to Andreas Bush's uh, presentation or Isabel Hertner's presentation that will follow Annette's, 
uh, please wait until the end of the, uh, the presentations and we will discuss them together. Annette, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Diane. This is, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me and apologies for me having to leave a bit earlier today, but we have a crazy week in the office this week with the Labour Party conference and um, and the sh fuel shortages, etc. PP. So I have to go back to work straight straight uh, at sharp uh, seven sharp. Um, just building directly on what Andreas um, explained so so enlightening and so interestingly. Um, I think the most interesting thing when you look at the situation in Germany at the moment and at the situation of Merkel's party is that how, while she was the stable factor for such a long time, she leaves her party now in quite a state, to put it mildly. Um, so the CDU without her isn't a successful party anymore. And it has not only to do with her leaving the CDU, but I think it also has to do with her having pushed the party so far to the center that in a way it is has been and that is an astonishing thing that happened during this election campaign that the social democratic candidate could easily mimic Merkel and say I'm the new Merkel because Merkel herself had sort of pushed this conservative rather right-wing party into the into the center of politics where the social democrat could take over her image and and plausibly yeah make his run his campaign by saying i i'm merkel not the guy who's running as a candidate for her party and that worked pretty well i mean it didn't work as well as it seemed uh, for some some uh, at a, some at some phases but it did work and um it's an astonishing thing what happened um and i think what will be very interesting now, it's very likely that, that I mean, as it looks at the moment, is that, that he, the social democratic new Merkel guy <laughs> will now uh, probably form a coalition and be the new chancellor. But what then will happen to uh, Merkel's old party? And, and that is probably the more interesting and probably also the more worrying fact, I think, because the big theme of this election and this election campaign has been fragmentation. The big political tent parties haven't really been holding the center ground anymore. And the CDU, after having lost, I mean, there's still a possibility that they might form a coalition after all, but I personally don't believe in it anymore. Uh, at this moment in time, um, the CDU will most probably, um, yeah, there is already quite some uproar about the the, the loss of the election, but the CDU will most probably, um, after some period of uproar, move back further to the right where they came from and maybe even further to the right. Because the other big problem that has Merkel has left, and interesting enough for her being, being a politician coming from the East, is that her party, especially her party, has been very, very um, weak in the East. I mean, in, in Thuringen and Sachsen, in two former East German areas and Bundesländer today, the AFD, the far right, has taken over as the first, the most popular party from the CDU. So this hasn't worked at all. I mean, the, the, the Merkel's party hasn't been able to, to, to get voters who, who want a conservative um, leadership, um, which I think has been problematic. I mean, she has been able to steer Germany um, by by bringing this together somehow with her personality. But I think Scholz, even if he tries to mimic her as much as he tr does it now, or tries to show himself as a stable factor, he won't be able to do that really. So there will be, uh, I think there will be a, he will be in a much more difficult situation because after Merkel, the situation will become as volatile as it has been for a long time. And Andrea said a German has induced a certain, uh, Angela Merkel has induced a certain sleepiness into, into the Germans, which is actually really true and a problem. But I think at some point, what has not been solved underneath this sleepiness and complacency will come up now and it will get more divisive, I think, and I'm not really sure whether Olaf Scholz will be able to, to hold that down and whether he should, because I think Germany is in urgent need, need of reform at the moment. So this is quite interesting at the moment uh, where this will lead. Um, at the moment, I think it will be rather a kind of social democratic green 
FDP coalition, the so-called traffic light coalition, but we'll have to wait and see. These coalition negotiations can take uh, a few months, as we know from last time. And I think, um, yeah, that, that can be, a, I wouldn't hold my breath that there aren't quite some surprises as well on the way. Um, what uh, I found astonishing was that the younger voters have voted um, mostly for the Greens, which we all knew, but also for the FDP, for the Liberals, who are a more um, yeah, right-wing liberal party than they used to be. So they are the party that has to, uh, that is sort of against tax rises. Um, uh, and they now have to find a common ground with the Greens who, who want the opposite to really um, uh, establish a stronger climate policy. Astonishing as well that um, the Greens have basically only gained 5% after the big floodings in Germany. I thought at the beginning that the Greens and the Poles were much better at the beginning that the Greens would get way more votes, which they didn't. That's quite astonishing if you think how much of an issue this will be. And this party, the Greens and the Liberal, the market Liberal Party has now to find common ground, which will be interesting. And also interesting, these two small parties will probably say at the end, have a big say in who is the Chancellor. Once they have found common ground, uh, they can more or less decide whether they want to play with with the Social Democrat Olaf Scholz or whether they, uh, after all, which the FDP would prefer would after all go uh, with Laschet, which would be the only way for him, the Merkel successor in, in her party to, um, to, uh, to survive politically, which um, he might not, uh, it doesn't look like that at the moment. So yeah, to just keep it short, it's an interesting time in, in German politics. I think everything that Merkel held sort of under these, the sleepiness sort of um, held back under, underneath this, um, sleepiness um, will now not be that quiet anymore. And I think whoever will uh, succeed her uh, will have a much more volatile and much more difficult and difficulty and, and much more fragmented situation that that he or she will find. And and with these remarks, I just like to leave it as um, I'd like to give some room for for questions. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. As I said, Annette has to leave us at uh, by seven o'clock. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask now, um, uh, please uh, type uh, your question in the chat facility. While you are thinking about your question, I was going to ask one that uh, one of our doctoral students, Dilwyn Griffiths, asks, um, which I guess relates to the entire panel. But since Annette will leave us at seven, I will ask now and the other speakers can think about it. Um, the question is, will a traffic light coalition be stable? Traffic light coalition, for those who don't know, is a coalition of the SPD, uh, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats, the FDP. So the question is, will such a coalition be stable in your view, uh, Annette? I mean, that very much depends on the talks between the FDP, the Liberals and the Green at the moment, because they're the ones who are ideologically the f furthest apart. If they find a compromise or if they find common ground, then I think there is, it's highly likely that it is stable because the Liberals cannot afford to have, let that explode again as they have done four years ago. For those who remember that four, four years ago it was, I think, uh, after six months of negotiations, the Liberals with the same candidate that, who is there now um, just uh, yeah, blew it and um, the whole thing ended up in a grand coalition. And I think the uh, Liberal candidate is under quite some pressure um, to not do that again this time. They cannot really afford that politically. And also they've learned from the, from the, yeah, from the failings of last time. So I think if there is, I, I'm actually quite optimistic at the moment. I don't know how you see that, Andreas, you're closer to, and, and Isabel, maybe you could, might be closer to the political situation in Germany. I was just there over the weekend for the elections. But I'm actually quite optimistic that it might work this time because I think both the Greens and the Liberals are very aware of what is at stake and that they, they, they just simply cannot afford to um, to not form a stable college. Okay, there are some interesting questions coming in. Uh, Andreas, do you have a comment? Just, just, just a very brief one. Um, I would mm. say that, of course, the, the, the Liberals are economically, I hesitate to call that right, they are market-oriented. 
uh, but in uh, um, what we commonly do, two dimensions and sort of on the social dimension, they're actually fairly close to 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 the greens. So it's 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 mm -hmm. merely about the um, um, about the economic sphere. Um, my hunch would be that actually there have been quite good, con quite close contacts uh, also between some of the leading politicians. There's more of a problem of the social democrats not really having. Uh, uh, much many contacts with the with the with the liberals, um, mm. but German um, 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 history shows you that once a coalition is formed, they usually last quite a long time. So we we haven't had that that actually coalitions break up in between. They fail at the electoral uh, ballot box at some point. But uh, so I would expect if that comes to uh, if, if it comes to a collision. I, but I think that's not yet, yet a foregone conclusion. Conclusion. It's very interesting that the Greens and the Liberals now sort of um, uh, sort of try to 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 discuss between themselves. But we must not forget that there is also the numerical. <clears throat> majority of a further grand coalition now under SPD leadership. So if the uh, Greens and the FDP sort of demand too much, the two still bigger parties may just call it a day and form a grand coalition, for which uh, which means that neither of the two big ones would have to go into opposition. If I could interject and add one point for the benefit of the students who uh, uh, are attending this event, uh, two things that are not perhaps widely known uh, in the UK, although our audience goes beyond the, the UK. Uh, one um, of the three parties that could be part of the uh, red, green and um, yellow coalition, the traffic light coalition, the Liberal Democrats, the FDP, is the one with the smallest amount of increase in the vote share. The other two have gone up quite significantly. Uh, so it would be a little bit bizarre to expect them to set the tone. The second point is that there is a, a, a tradition of coalition governments in Germany that has a very specific, very important empirical element. When these parties, large parties uh, uh, and smaller parties uh, organize coalitions, they also write it down. And I know cases in the past, in 2013, for example, where the German coalition agreement ran into the hundreds of pages, more than 200 pages. The, the 2013 coalition. And I think the, the recent one was a pretty lengthy document as well. This is perhaps one of the reasons why they tend to be um, both stable and uh, uh, quite well organized and quite well run. And I think Germany is a very good example of why coalition governments, which are still poo pooed here in the UK, can be a very good example of why a more proportional system can be said to work very, very well. Nobody would associate Germany with the absence of political stability at any point in time since 1945, at least. I'm saying this because there is an ongoing discussion in some segments of the British political elite about the need for electoral reform in the UK. Um, OK, I can take one more question because we still have some time before um, Annette has to leave us. One question is, do you expect the German uh, government's position uh, on refugees to change in the future, in the next foreseeable uh, few years? I mean, that, that very much depends on, on who will form that government in the end. But uh, overall, I do not expect that at the moment. What I could mm. imagine is what I just tried to describe before, that in case the CDU does not, is, is going into the opposition and will have to find its identity again, I could imagine that they might, they might go further to the right, which I do okay. personally think is a very good idea um, because as, as, as every time a party, conservative party tries to, uh, and we have seen that in Britain, tries to sort of um, fight a far right party by imitating them, um, they just move themselves to the right. I mean, the Tories are now the Brexit party, if you like. And um, I think that wouldn't be a good idea, but I could, I can see within the CDU, I can see a few politicians who would very much like that. I mean, like Merz and so on. And, and they might be willing to take up a more anti-refugee uh, standpoint. But overall, I mean, I don't think this will change very much. And to be honest, I mean, Merkel let the, famously let these uh, refugees in in 2015. But afterwards, she's done everything to not 
uh, do that again. So even doing rather dirty deals with Erdogan, et cetera, PP. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Merkel has been as liberal as she, as her reputation sometimes is. Um, she's been balancing out things, um, but um, and I w but I wouldn't also. That's why I would also not expect that um, it, it, this okay. the kind of position of the next government, whoever it is, would very much change. Uh, although, as I said, if the CDU moves further to the right after um, not being able to form a government, that might change the situation. But yeah, that's something okay. we have to wait and see. And final question, since we do have a few minutes left, uh, specifically for you, uh, Annette. Um, are there any lessons that the Labour Party can learn from the SPD? I've been uh, I'm saying this in, in, the, in the, I know in the presence of Isabel, uh, who uh, also attended the Labour Party conference, and I'm sure she will be asked the same question later on. So, are yeah, there any lessons? It's a really interesting question. I mean, it's sort of, I mean, of course, I mean, the Labour Party has watched this election and the campaign very closely. And of course, some people I know from the Labour Party have sort of thought about this. On the other hand, it's, it's, I don't think it, it has anything, it, it, I don't think that Labour can imitate that here because what happened is that Scholz imitated Merkel, <laughs> if you like, <laughs> and, and sort of portrayed himself as the stable, experienced, boring, candidate of the center which is very sexy in germany but not here um as <laughs> what Keir Starmer currently experiences because i mean he is the sensible stable boring candidate who stands for the rule of law and democracy but it's not sexy in britain so i think um this the labor party here there's not much they can really um take on board from what's happening in germany currently Okay, thank you very much indeed. I, I don't see any further questions that could be uh, asked right now. Thanks very much for giving up some thank of your time. Uh, it's a very busy period for you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening and thanks for having thank me. You. Bye, Annette. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Um, now the floor is handed over to uh, Isabelle Hertner, who, as I said earlier, is a senior lecturer in politics at King's College uh, London and has been asked to talk to us about the European policy-related implications of the German um, federal election, in, to the extent that one can foresee these things. Uh, Isabelle, you have the floor but I can ah now you you are unmuted. Yes. Okay. So can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you and we can we can see you as well. Um, Fantastic. Let um, me make a final uh, adjustment that will then give you the floor electronically as well. Um, okay. All right, we are all ears. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for having me, first of all, and yeah, for, for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, the electoral campaign and um, the EU, basically. So, um, in this election campaign, unfortunately, the EU didn't play any major role, um, especially compared to the last election campaign in, in 2017 where Martin Schulz um, was the SPD's um, chancellor candidate and, of course, with his background as the former president of the European Parliament, um, he did bring uh, the European element into that election. This was lacking this time. So I found these um, elections quite parochial, um, like we see in Britain normally. Um, and um, I think there were a lot of opportunities lost because those were important debates to be had. And um, also, there are quite a lot of differences between the parties um, when it comes to EU um, policies. So it's a shame that they weren't discussed and um, a lot focused on the personalities of the, ca of the um, candidates and on future coalitions, um, but not so much on the substance. And I think that is a pity. 
and yeah, as I said, a missed opportunity. So compared to what we see in the UK, the Germany's mainstream parties are very much um, pro-integrationist. So um, all the mainstream parties um, are and, and were this time around. So the CDU, the SPD, the Liberals um, and the Greens um, all very much um, pro-integration. Only the left party, Die Linke, um, who, who finds the EU too neoliberal, too militaristic, um, they offer a stronger critique of the European Union as it currently is. And of course, but that's a totally different matter. Again, the far right who wants the AfD, who wants Germany to leave the EU. But I'm not going to focus on these two parties because um, they don't stand a chance um, of, of entering any, any German government. So um, in particular, having said all of that, in particular, the Greens and the FDP provide a clearer vision of the EU than the big parties do. That's interesting. Um, and the Greens even aspire to a federal European republic and the FDP to a decentralized federal European state. Yeah, for them, that is the ultimate goal of European integration. The other parties don't really say anything about that. I'm now going to talk about uh, three particular policy areas that I think are relevant. Um, and the first one is EU institutional reform. Sounds a bit boring, but is important. Um, and interestingly, all mainstream parties want to empower the European Parliament and they want to give the European Parliament the power to initiate legislation, which currently, as you probably know, only the European Commission has. Um, also, the FDP and Greens, they explicitly support the Spitzenkandidaten process, which again empowers the European Parliament and the European parties who can select um, their candidates for um, the European Commission presidency. And the Greens also won transnational parties, so not every country having their own lists, but a pan-European wide, where voters in, um, in Greece get to vote for um, Finnish MEPs, Bulgarian MEPs, and so on and so forth. So given that there is relatively um, little difference between the mainstream parties, this should not be much of a um, bone of contention during any sort of coalition negotiations. But it is my next area that might cause problems. So I'm now looking at economic and monetary um, policy, which is of course hugely important uh, for the European Union. And here then we can see some important differences. So um, I'm gonna start with the Greens because they want to um, increase the EU budget. Yeah? Um, they say that the EU's recovery and resilience facility, which um, are the loans and grants um, that uh, member states can use to mitigate the impact um, of the COVID um, pandemic, um, that that should be made permanent. Yeah, even when the worst of the pandemic is um, behind us, this should be a permanent um, fund and it should be controlled by the European Parliament. So that's what the Greens say. The CDU and uh, the Liberals, by contrast, they don't want to make this uh, facility permanent at all. Um, so there we could see some kind of friction um, between the Greens and um, the FDP. The SPD is somewhere in between most of these positions, a little bit vague, pro-European for sure, um, but relatively vague on, on what they actually want to do. Um, what they say is that they want more sustainability and solidarity in the European Union, a real fiscal, economic and social union. Um, what that really means is, is sometimes um, rather unclear to me. They do say a few things. So the SPD says that the EU should have more resources, more own resources through taxation. So big tech companies, when they get taxed, for instance, that money should go to the European Union. Um, and also um, 
They say that there shouldn't be any more unanimity voting when it comes to taxation, just to make sure that member states cannot veto, um, veto such, no single member state can veto um, European taxation decisions. Um, interestingly, um, the CDU, Greens and SPD think that there should be an EU financial transaction tax. This has been ongoing. This is an old topic, really nothing new, nothing revolutionary, really. Um, but this is what they all say. But the FDP is against the Liberals, against any EU tax. Yeah, they think taxation is something for the member states to sort out and please low taxes generally. Um, so here again, we can see certain differences. Yeah. And um, importantly as well, the FDP and the CDU, they remain quite conservative when it comes to the EU Stability and Growth Pact. Um, and they want to introduce sanctions for member states who constantly breach the criteria. Again, nothing new. Um, they have had that attitude um, for a while. Um, and what it means in practice is um, advocating for further austerity in Europe, because if, if those um, sanctions are financial, it'll hit countries who are already um, not doing very well economically. Meanwhile, the SPD wants to transform the pact into a new sustainability pact. Not entirely sure what, what they mean by that um, yet again. Um, finally, the SPD and the Greens want to introduce an EU-wide um, minimum wage. Um, that echoes what the SPD has done in, in the German context, where they said they would like to increase uh, the German minimum wage to 12 uh, euros um, per hour, um, which affects 10 million workers in, in Germany. So it's not a small uh, thing. So And the same then to have an EU-wide minimum wage. So overall, we can see that um, when it comes to economic and monetary policy, the Greens and the FDP, FDP sorry, are rather far um, apart. Um, meanwhile, the SPD and the Greens are, are closer together. So for them, it wouldn't be perhaps all that difficult to find common grounds. But the small tax um, FDP, um, I think that could um, create um, certain problems. Um, when they negotiate a common economic, um, economic and monetary um, policy. Finally, briefly, um, there's also, an, of course, EU foreign and security policy, and all um, parties agree that something needs to be done about that. That um, perhaps the euro, the EU, is pushing below its weight, um, and that um, it needs to become more effective in its decision-making process, and it needs to introduce quali quali qualified majority voting, sorry, um, to avoid vetoes from from certain member states in foreign and security policy. Um, the CDU, SPD and FDP want a European Defence Union and European Armed Forces, but the FDP goes furthest in detail um, on how a European army could be built and how it should be controlled by Parliament. They don't say which Parliament, I'm assuming the European Parliament, but it could also require national parliaments. Um, they all want um, NATO to, um, obviously Germany to remain in NATO and um, NATO to, re to remain um, important. They all want um, to keep sanctions on Russia, so here they agree. But where they don't agree is on EU enlargement. Um, so here the Greens and SPD say, um, let's advance negotiations with, Western, with the Western Balkans. Um, the CDU doesn't want any further enlargement, and the FDP says um, the EU should stop accession talks with um, Turkey. Not that that is really on the table at the moment, but anyway. So the real disagreement at the moment is, is there on, on EU enlargement. So overall, to bring um, my quick talk here to a, to a closure, um, if we get a traffic light coalition between SPD, um, FDP and the Greens, um, then I think it will be the economic and monetary policy of the EU 
that will create most um, difficulties in the negotiations um, because they are furthest apart um, in that area. And of course, that would make it very difficult for, for the German government to have any sort of grand vision on the EU where so much is done through economic integration when you cannot agree um, and when you have no ambitious plans, but only the lowest common denominator. So, yeah, that would be my, um, my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Isabel. Um, now, there are some questions that have been asked in the chat facility. Uh, I encourage all participants to think about questions they would like to ask. I was wondering whether I can abuse while Andreas is thinking about his own comments. Uh, uh, I was wondering whether I can abuse a little bit my powers as chair and ask you, Isabel, a specific question since you have particular expertise in social democratic parties and the issue of European integration more, more broadly. Uh, and you have attended the Labour Party conference as a speaker uh, 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 recently. Whether I can uh, ask the same question uh, of you, um, is there anything that the Labour Party can learn from the SPD's um, campaign, government practice, uh, and certainly um, uh, election result? And if so, what? Mm, yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think only to a limited extent. Because, of course, the German federal state um, is quite different from, uh, from the UK's rather um, centralized state. Um, Olaf Scholz had um, already got a lot of experience uh, when he was um, prime minister of um, Hamburg. And um, then he was, of course, finance minister. He is finance minister in the Grand Coalition. So um, that gave him um, a lot of experience. So he's seen as a safe pair of hands with a lot of political experience. And uh, Keir Starmer hasn't had that type of experience because there haven't been many coalition um, governments in, in the UK and certainly no grand coalition. Um, and he was not first minister of Scotland or Wales um, or anything like that. So he doesn't have the same um, clout, so to say, and ex experience um, as, as Olaf Scholz. Um, so that is one issue. The other one is that his, his rather calm, um, perhaps boring um, um, personality um, goes down well with, um, with a part of German voters, but in the UK not so much. Um, look at who they voted um, into number 10 Downing Street. Um, Boris Johnson is, is certainly not boring, um, but um, he's lots of other things which I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, so, so that is another issue that makes the comparison um, rather difficult. Um, but policy-wise, I think I think what, what Olaf Scholz did quite well is the issue of respect. That was a big, um, a big part of the SPD's campaign and appeal is to show respect to all voters, to not talk down to anybody, but to actually make, uh, make clear that um, you know, key workers have done so much during the pandemic. We need to increase their wages, not just clap our hands. So. Um, respect was part of the slogan and I think that has chimed uh, with many voters and that is something that the Labour Party could very well um, um, perhaps also Im improve on. Okay. Um, Can I yeah. add something? Great, I was about to give you the floor Andreas, you have the floor. Thank you. Isabel, I would like to challenge you a number of, on a number of things, so let's, let's think it's too boring for our audience. Um, on your first on your first point of Keir Starmer not having any experience, can I remind you that Tony Blair didn't have any experience in government whatsoever. In fact, the Tory leadership, uh, the Tory government from 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 Thatcher to 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 Major had been so long that actually hardly anybody of the Labour front 
had known uh, sort of uh, what what government looks like. So I don't think that's the decisive thing. You need to, however, and that's where we probably agree, you need to engender some sort of enthusiasm in your audience. And that is something where he could, of course, up his game. Also, boredom uh, actually can live quite well in with the British public and successfully. Uh, I already mentioned uh, uh, John Major, uh, but I would add Jim Callaghan. So uh, um, British successful British prime minister haven't always been sort of the show people uh, or the charismatic leaders. Um, what strikes me as the most important um, 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 additional point is that this is not only Schultz's campaign. Um, this is a sort of truce between a left wing party leadership composed of Saskia Esken and Norbert Walter Borjans, whose name nobody can pronounce, um, um, and Scholz. So it's it's in a way it has turned out as a, a fortunate uh, um, result that Scholz lost the race for the SPD leadership. Um, because the left wing is now actually was agreed that uh, they should try to run with a successful right wing um, sort of in terms of the internal party wings um, um, candidate. And that is what is lacking in the Labour Party. There is no truce between the Corbynites and whatever you what you, used to be the Blairites. There is no truce. There is open warfare. Uh, and that has become very evident now uh, at, the part, at the Labour Party conference, which, by the way, has also uh, is is deeply split among the issue of of, of uh, electoral uh, reform. Um, the um, the uh, constituency parties had an overwhelming majority for it, and the so-called what are they called? Not not the affiliated affiliated the affiliated. I was I, I thought it, I should call them the institutionalized ones, but. Um, Affiliates, of course, is much more friendly. Uh, and the affiliates block that. So um, there is warfare going on. What we have in the ESPD, surprisingly, and until eight weeks ago, nobody would have thought that, is a sort of Nixon goes to China logic. It's only a left wing, a credible left wing um, party leadership that actually could successfully support a right wing uh, a candidate like Scholz. And if you look at the past social democratic chancellors, they've always hailed from the right wing of the party. Brandt did. He only sort of became more leftish in his in old age. Um, Schmidt certainly did. Schröder undoubtedly. Um, and he did a similar game with La Fontaine. So they also, so that's something that I think the, um, um, that the Labour Party could learn if it wanted to learn, but it doesn't want to learn at the moment. Sorry, this was rather long. And this is interesting. It, it's important to note the, the relevance of the electoral system, uh, which is dramatically different, as uh, both of you know, in the two countries. Isabel, do, do you want to come back briefly before we uh, broaden up our discussion to other topics? Yeah, just very briefly. I think because of the German electoral system, um, there is the left party and it is represented in, um, in the Bundestag and also in, in a number of um, state assemblies. And, you know, the left wing um, Corbyn supporters um, in, in the UK, um, they don't really have such an, um, such an opportunity. They're still part of the Labour Party um, because no other small left wing party um, is going to win lots of seats in the House of Commons, right? And the German system allows that. So that that split has, in the end, probably been good for the SPD in terms of keeping unity, even if there are differences. Of course, it is not as divided as Labour. Great, thank you. Um, we have several interesting questions that, that are being asked, and uh, one hopefully interesting that I want to ask later on. Uh, uh, if we can, can go back to the original cycle of our talks, there is a question from my colleague Ben Worthy who asks, who has written about leadership, and he asks briefly, how do you expect Merkel to be perceived in 10 years time? Not, not now, not in 2021. 10 years time, what will her legacy look like? Or how is she going to be perceived? Shall I answer? If you want, yes, oh, okay, and then okay, it's okay. Okay, okay. Um, 
I think she will become the new Helmut Schmidt, who was sort of um, uh, perceived sort of wisdom personified. Um, um, and um, she will be uncontroversial. Everybody will. I, I, I don't know whether she, she will want to be in the public limelight. I rather suspect she will not, uh, because she's not as vain as uh, Schmidt was. Um, I think she will continue to be looked upon very favorably, uh, particularly because she will she has a, a, a personal uh, modesty that will um, um, keep her from 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 basically selling herself out to the highest bidder as Gerhard Schröder, for example, has done. Um, so uh, in my view, um, Germans will continue to look back on her favorably. Um, um, the passing of time always makes memories sort of tilt more towards the favorable oh. size, side. But um, she, the, as I said, she continues to be a very popular uh, politician. And I think that um, that will uh, continue to be the case. Thank you, Andreas. Isabel? I would, yeah, I would agree with that. But let's also see how the next 10 years are going uh, for German politics. Um, if there are some useful and much needed reforms um, happening, um, then I think that people will say, yeah, OK, but it was really, you know, time she left. Um, someone new needed to come and, and sort a few things out. But if this is just a coalition of infighting and no clear directions and constant um, yeah constant discussions um, then and no effective decision making then people will want Angela Merkel back. <laughs> uh, can, can I okay. add something sure. uh, um, is just to say that yeah. I, um, I, I disagree um, with something that Annette said before, uh, in her comments but I wanted, didn't want to leave that unchallenged because she said she expect, expects the CDU to move to the right, back to the right. Um, I would question that. Um, um, the thing is that um, if you look at, there's two things in Sunday's result, uh, which is quite interesting. I know there's been a discussion about where the, has the CDU moved too far to the center. But if you look at the electoral uh, of the of the way voters actually change their behavior, then you will see that the CDU lost not to the right, but to the to the center or to the left. CDU voters migrated to the SPD and to the Greens. If you want to win them back, you cannot turn to the right. And um, the AFD that must be mentioned also lost. Uh, it is it is often being uh, portrayed in the results that they are actually doing better that they are winning in the east they're not winning they're not increasing their number of sh uh, their share of the vote uh, so um, um, in that respect i think one of the, the the big things and annette did mention that is that it's a recentering uh, of the german electorate which is a good thing in a time where in many countries we see increased polarization uh, with um, with the uh, parties actually moving further apart so um, I think that's a good result. And I think any uh, also I, I, I don't think the present CDU, which has the, the, the strongly sort of is marked by, by Angela Merkel, um, will not substantially move back. And the, the CSU leader, Markus Söder, tried that, but he saw that this is not electorally beneficial and he is one of the fiercest uh, people in this in the uh, CDU CSU to fight the AFD. Okay, Andreas, thank you very much. I did abuse my power as chair to have this slide from um, last week's uh, well last Sunday's election, which indicates uh, changes in the vote of people who voted for AfD, the far right party, in 2017, and you see significant numbers basically they've lost uh, a large uh, part of the vote that they had and you will see that quite a lot of people um, 60,000 are um, uh, estimated to, ha to have switched to uh, the Christian Democrats 
uh, almost four times that amount have switched to the uh, social democrats and there are also 60,000 who have believed to have switched to the green so I think this is an important point to note because it, it also relates to what uh, Isabel was saying uh, earlier about uh, the social democrats as both of you will know there's an ongoing discussion in the UK about the extent to which uh, the Labour Party should um, incorporate and express the views of what is traditionally known as blue Labour. Uh, so I think if there are lessons that perhaps um, the Social Demo the um, Labour Party can learn in, in, in the UK, they should certainly include uh, how to increase your uh, vote share without necessarily aping um, the message of the far right and the um, conservatives with a small c kind of voter. Um, now, we have a lot of uh, interesting questions that are being asked. I, I, I would like to um, uh, uh, um, mention some of them and ask what you think. Uh, one question is about foreign policy change beyond Europe, basically. Um, do you expect the, uh, Germany's foreign policy to change in the next four or five years under a new administration? Um, Anyone who would like to start? I think that's Isabel's uh, uh, field of competence. Um, I actually don't expect radical change. I mean, it will still be um, about the transatlantic um, relationship, even though everyone in Germany has realized that um, the US is no longer all that interested in Europe, um, including um, Germany, and that Europe really needs to up um, its game a little bit. So they've they've all understood that, but um, still there is at least lip service to the to the transatlantic relationship. Um, I'm not sure if the stance on on Russia is going to change much. Angela Merkel has often been criticized that she hasn't been um, critical enough towards the Chinese government, that she's put um, the German export market above um, other questions like um, the treatment of religious minorities and of course human rights um, in China. Um, and is that going to change perhaps a little bit? Um, I think depending on what coalition we have, but um, who is Germany to take on China anyway? Um, so I think I, I don't really expect radical change. What I would hope is that the European policy is a bit is going to be a bit more ambitious than it has been um, under Merkel recently. We we'll um, come to that. We we'll come to that. Yeah, so yes. maybe I stop here then. Okay, Andreas, do you want to chip in? You don't have to. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah, uh, just, another just, question. Just to briefly say that I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, my feeling is also that there is not going to, it's going to, we have a broad consensus. Uh, um, many of us wish there would be a bit more initiative. It, it will depend on who personally, which persons will come into the lead there. Uh, the foreign minister of the past government hasn't been a very imaginative, ambitious or otherwise exciting person. Um, and. Um, um, that can well change if, for example, the Liberals, if I, I'm, I'm thinking of Alexander Lambsdorff or people who have experience on the European level um, um, uh, get into the driver's seat on that. That may well be the case, it depends, but uh, it's not going to be radical change. Hopefully a bit more um, uh, ambitious, particularly on the European level. We saw that in the, it was mentioned, I, I think Isabel, you mentioned that in the last um, uh, coalition treaty, in the last uh, um, um, election campaign, but it all centered on the on the personality of Martin Schulz. And as soon as he was sidelined, there was nothing left. Uh, although he remained an MP, and although the Social Democrats kept the foreign, sec uh, foreign ministry, uh, but there was just nothing going on. If I could interject to support your point, uh, one of the bugbears about the outgoing uh, government was that, um, that I had, 
uh, as an observer was that uh, the coalition agreement mentioned that uh, they were trying to they, they would try to bring back the community method to the center of EU decision making and nothing happened <laughs> they did not uh, I mean this did not materialize so just to amplify the point that you have made now we have another question that relates specifically to Germany but with a domestic focus and I was wondering whether I can uh, uh, ask you to uh, think about this and tell us what you think. One question is um, then, then the necessity for reform has been mentioned in some of your talks. Um, what are the top three changes that in your view Germany needs? Be they domestic or international? Who, who wants to start? Isabel? <laughs> okay, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can start. Um, so, um, of course, a big issue was climate change um, in the campaign and for young voters in particular because the, um, and I think this has been mentioned, I think Annette mentioned that, that uh, particularly young voters voted for the Green Party, also for the FDP, of course, but um, the Green Party was the big winner of this election yeah um they won 51 new seats i think i got the number right um and so this is a huge demand and here really really germany europe and the whole world has to do something you cannot let um you this this cannot yeah it, it cannot continue like this and um, German young voters have cared about that very much. The demonstrations have been very strong, much stronger than, for instance, here in the UK. So, um, and that requires, of course, infrastructure for renewable energies, and, and that has to happen faster than um, 10 years um, from now. So um, that has to change. And generally, digitization has also been an issue in the campaign because German public administration is really outdated. And um, COVID has highlighted that, you know, software programs that can't communicate uh, with each other in the health sector and um, public um, authorities still using fax machines um, in our time and age um, is a lack of investment in infrastructure in, in Germany. And um, that is something that really does have to change. Isabel, one point to make in, in a visual sense, as uh, Andreas is thinking about his answer to the question, uh, I'm showing uh, attendees the increase or decrease in the uh, share of the vote of the uh, six main parties um, between 2017 and 2021. Um, just to gain, just to give people a, an understanding of what has actually changed in terms of uh, electoral vote share. Uh, in these elections, you will see that, as Isabel said, uh, the Greens obtained uh, a significant increase in, the, in their powers, in the, the vote share in, in the elections. Yes, but there is, there, is, there is one thing I would like to add to that, and that is, mm -hmm. yes, the Greens have done better. Uh, I've defended them against people who, um, 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 but, but look, they've done better, but they've done far less well than they expected six or even four or even two months ago. Well, no, not, not two months ago, but four months ago. So, um, you know, they wanted to lead the government. They wanted to lead, to become the dominant party in Germany, and they failed to do that. So that must be mentioned as well to give a full picture. Um, and they have strangely, uh, I can't quite understand it. They, I mean, if you, if you listen to Baerbock's speeches, um, she focused almost exclusively on the climate issue uh, when six months ago they seemed to be far broader. And um, I think this, un in my view, unnecessary limitation on ever more urgent uh, talk about, um, um, the, uh, um, uh, about the climate issue um, has actually not done them well. It has restricted them to their core constituency and they have not managed to go much beyond that. It's okay. They've they they have increased their share of the vote, but I mean there were periods when, in the opinion polls, they were Germany's strongest party, and and that must mm. also be mentioned. Um, 
let me say, let me ask, uh, let me answer uh, my three takes. Actually, I probably have four, uh, but three <laughs> p uh, points. Uh, the first is um, uh, the administration has to become more nimble. That's right. Um, I'm not quite sure whether, of course, there's been much joking, has been much joking about the um, health, the local health offices uh, using fax machines, but I would submit that they still um, did quite better than many other countries or certain other countries uh, where um, uh, local um, health administration in the COVID uh, crisis did not work well. So, but there is a, there is an agreement there. Um, it's interesting, by the way, to say that German, the German federal system, which always lends itself to being blamed if something goes, goes wrong, has actually be, be gained more support from the uh, German population, if you look at opinion polls, during the crisis. So it's been perceived as actually doing quite well. But still, there needs to be a change. Digitalization is obviously another thing. There is underinvestment there. I completely agree with Isabel. However, that's a bit difficult to do if there were more, more sort of... Um, hands-on uh, investment from the state, uh, that would certainly be welcome. That will be difficult in any future coalition because any future coalition will likely involve the FDP. Um, there will need to be a, a, a sort of big bargain uh, to find some uh, new, um, as it's now called, progressive um, thing. Um, the third thing I need, uh, I think, and for which I actually am, would be quite optimistic is uh, reform of the electoral system. Um, the fragmentation of the German party system has led to um, um, increases in the size of parliament. This has been going far better than many of us feared this time around. It's only been, I think, something like 26 additional seats. Um, this has to do with the mechanics of the system. And uh, in the old coalition, the grand coalition, the two big parties um, sort of blocked more uh, ambitious uh, reform um, um, ideas that the Liberals, the Greens and the Left Party together had. And since two of them will be in a new government, I assume, uh, I hope there will be more help in that respect. As far as climate change policy is going to be, um, uh, is concerned, everybody wants that. Um, but to actually implement it is quite difficult. I can tell you here, and that, that's going to be a challenge for the Green Party. The Green Party has been the party that uh, or has always supported local initiatives. If, if you look back at the 1970s, that's the, the fertile ground from which they actually grew. And I can tell you, because I live in a part of Germany where the um, um, Energiewende, the, the, the whole change and the, the, the big sort of um, um, electric lanes are going to be built, um, that is a very, very um, a difficult thing for the Greens uh, to, to deal with. Our local MP is Jürgen Trittin, the former environment minister, yeah. and he always raves about how we need the energy vendor, how this must come, come faster. And then he travels 10 kilometers, goes to the local initiatives, mostly run by the Green parties, in a sort of strong nimbyism, not in my backyard approach, and supports them by try, when they try to block uh, the fact that uh, big power lines should actually go across their territory. You, well, as is famously said, you can't have your cake and eat it, although there are <laughs> eminent people who, who dispute that. But um, the Greens will have to decide whether they actually want more power lines in order to have wind uh, and, and renewable energy transported in Germany from the north to the south, whether you actually want to speed that up or whether you want to have year-long administrative processes uh, and, and, and then very little to be built. So that's a very big challenge, and that's something that the Green Party will have to resolve internally, and that's going to be a challenge because it goes back uh, sort of challenging some of their raison d'etre. We can't hear you, Dionysus, if you were talk. I think you were talking. Sorry. Uh, yes, I was muted. Um, you see, I can be self-disciplined, uh, despite being originally Greek. Uh, the uh, one question that um, uh, I would like to ask that relates to um, Andreas's presentation uh, comes from one of our um, participants who says, who asks basically whether Merkel's era has amplified the personality politics trend 
or whether this is going to be um, uh, not part of the legacy? In my view, um, not. Um, we had a political science literature something like 15 years ago talking about the presidentialization of parliamentary uh, systems. Um, uh, that, I think, grew out of a time when there were sort of rather flamboyant people uh, uh, at the top of their respective uh, parties. I think of Berlusconi, I think of Tony Blair and of Gerhard Schröder. Um, but um, um, while you could say there is some sort of personality cult about uh, Angela Merkel, I don't think it is a politics of personal uh, of personality in that respect. And if you if you look at uh, so you don't have the sort of you don't have a Macron, um, um, so you don't have the sort of people who focus on their very person, like in Austria as well, and sort of basically obliterate the party structures around them. It's a it's a populist strategy. In the German system, uh, I think it is the the um, um, recent campaign is another, uh, or would rather support that it's the parties that are still the um, uh, the breeding ground for politicians to 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 rise up um, through the ranks um, and not um, a person a, pers a personality um, um, sort of focus. So uh, you've just right uh, exactly. Um, Darkness is um, Pogundke was the one I was thinking of. Uh, um, I've taught that to my students 15 years ago, but, but I always made question marks and said, I, I'm afraid this is probably going to uh, be focused on these specific people. And uh, there's, in my view, there is no, no law of a sort of movement in that direction. I think that the, um, if you look at the, uh, at the UK, if you look at Germany, the successive um, uh, prime ministers and it's only been one chancellor, um, are, I think, rather supporting the point. Thanks. Isabel? You're muted. I don't think I actually have anything to, to add that's, there. I, um, I that's, that's, on that's that. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering whether I can abuse my power as chair for the last time, since it is uh, getting a bit late, and I realize that I don't know where Isabel is, but uh, I know Andreas is in Germany, so it's quite late, uh, uh, almost quarter to nine in Germany. Um, I was wondering whether you have any thoughts on a final question, which also comes from the audience, but also myself. Do you expect the new German government, of whatever persuasion it is, to have a different stance and if you do, what kind of stance will it be on the issue of the rule of law sort of crisis in the EU? Do you expect the next German administration to behave differently vis-a-vis -vis people like Orban, for example, or the Polish government? I'll start with that, um, if you don't mind, because I'd like to leave the last word here to Isabel, which, who I think is more okay. an expert on that. Um, the, 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 the toughest position on both Hungary and Poland, but also on China, foreign policy, in my observation, has come from the Greens, particularly uh, from Annalena Baerbock. Um, if there were a um, future government in which, and I think that is well within the realm of the possible, uh, she might be, for example, the foreign minister, um, I could foresee that there is a, a toughening of the position. However, on the European level, and that's something that I've always sort of brought up as an argument uh, to, to those of my colleagues who push more in that direction. Um, Germany is also very keen on sort of keeping the EU together um, with its very intricate um, majority mechanisms. However, we've seen over the last uh, month and I think the last year perhaps that there's been a gradual toughening. So. Um, um, I would expect um, the um, not only to, for them to, to, to show the instruments, but actually to exert uh, more pressure. That's my, um, my hunch, but I'm, I think I'm not much more than an observer. Uh, Isabel, you're the expert on that, so I'd be very interested to hear what you say. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, well, the Greens will be part of any new um, coalition, that is what I think. You can, I think they cannot be. Um, 
they can't be ignored and um, kept out out of the new coalition. And I do think they will be um, stricter because of, um, of course, the freedom of, of press and all of that. Um, the recent um, restrictions on abortion in Poland, for instance, um, you know, the, the Greens are the most outspoken feminist um, party as well, and they see that as another violation of, of uh, rights. Um, and also, I think, I mean, Angela Merkel was obviously quite involved in the European People's Party, and they took a very, very, very long time to take a proper stance against Orban and actually um, suspend the membership. Um, of Orban's party. So for a long time they were dithering and not doing anything about it and had had Merkel not and, and her colleagues not had that stance, perhaps the EU as a whole would have reacted differently and more swiftly. So I do think um, the new German government will have a stricter um, approach um, to Hungary and also Poland's, um, yeah, democratic backsliding democratic backsliding which is a very um convenient way uh, for me personally to end this session which has been very interesting from my perspective at least because the next jamone event that i have organized for this year will take place on the 9th of november and will focus on the crisis uh, of the rule of law in the eu we have a panel of very eminent speakers uh, it will be again an online event um, the details of which appear in the uh, uh, website that I have uploaded, the URL I have uploaded on um, the chat facility. I would like to take this uh, opportunity to thank both of you and Annette Didat who has left for um, spending some of your free time with us, talking about a country that you know uh, far better than anybody else uh, in uh, the immediate vicinity. Uh, we are very grateful for this. As I said at the beginning, this event has been um, uh, video recorded. The video recording will be made available through the Jean Monnet Chair's website 